Good morning again, everyone. Let me make sure my sound is okay. We're adjusting this morning. Amen. Um, I'm so glad, as I said, I'm so glad Marianne prayed for technology this morning because we were, we didn't want to pray for technology when things got started this morning. Uh, sometimes things work and sometimes things don't, but we're thankful also that the Lord just helps us when things don't go as smoothly as, as we would want them to go. For, go. Uh, we just keep on going and the Lord's, Lord's giving us wisdom just to keep going. So uh, we're glad you're with us. We know for some probably, uh, we hope nobody gave up in despair when you couldn't get the tech working just right. But um, anyhow, we're together whether you are joining us this morning in your home or whether you're going to be catching us a little bit later when we post again this afternoon. We are glad that you are with us. And um, in spite of difficulties with tech, in spite of delays, God still has a word for us. Amen. God is never pushed off track. He, he is never delayed. He never says, oh, phooey, the tech didn't work right this morning. That's not the way God is. Um, God has it all together. And so as they were trying to make things work, um, I was praying just for a, uh, because God has given me a word for us, and I was praying for a quiet spirit uh, to be able to bring to each one of us the word of the Lord this morning that he has for us. And so uh, and so I invite you, we're just going to, let me just give a quick, a short prayer uh, as we get into the word of God, and I'm checking the time, we'll adjust <coughs> several different things this morning. But Lord, we do come to you this morning. And God, we thank you that you brought us together, whether online or here in this place, to uh, keep things going this morning. And so we ask, oh Lord, that you would, that we would, we know you're going to speak. Lord, what we need is still hearts before you, so that we can hear your word to us. And so Lord, each one of us right now, because you have given us a spirit of self-control, which is the fruit of the spirit, Right now, oh Lord, we ask that that fruit would be manifest in our lives and that we would take captive every thought that would seek to pull us in one direction or another, that we would take the frustration that perhaps many of us are feeling right now trying to make things go smoothly or we've been thinking, why isn't it going well or going smoothly? And Lord, we take those things and we bring them captive to you in subjection to the Lordship of Jesus Christ you are our Lord. Tech is not our Lord. This world is not our Lord. You are our Lord. And we give our hearts to receive your word and our ears to hear and our will to choose you this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we turn again to the word of the Lord this morning. And last week we spoke uh, about digging wells. And I appreciated what um, Moses said this morning about being from Sierra, Sierra Leone and really understanding what it means to dig a well and the importance of wells. And uh, God put that very specifically on my heart uh, for last Sunday morning. Um, and at the same time, as I mentioned to you, I already told you last week that uh, what God had put on my heart was dig a well, build an altar. There was no way to put all that in one week. There, there's barely enough time to put it in two weeks. But this morning we're going to be looking at this part of it. And as you know, we have been going back to the Old Testament and looking at things in the Old Testament that are pictures for us. Uh, remember what we've said again, we've been saying it for the last several weeks, that the uh, New Testament is in the Old Concealed, that the Old Testament is in the new revealed. And sometimes, uh, depending on how the Lord leads, it helps us to either go to the Old Testament or the New Testament and to see something that is helpful and useful for our lives. And so we are returning again primarily to the Old Testament this morning. And this morning, we're going to go back one generation. We looked at Isaac last week, and Isaac was characterized by being a digger of wells. And we saw that we saw that in the pattern of his life, and we talked about what that means for us uh, um, as New Testament Christians, what that means to dig a well in our lives. So this morning, we go back one generation, and if we go back one generation, you know to whom we are going, don't we? If we go back one generation, who are we going to? Abraham, right? Abraham, one of the giant characters, one of the giant figures of the Old Testament. 
uh, just as Joseph is and just as some of the others are. But I want to say this morning, even before we go any further, as we look at the life of Abraham, although we look at Abraham and put him on a high pedestal, um, and we say, oh, Abraham, the father of faith, I want us to understand this morning that when we talk about the father of faith, he is not necessarily someone that we look up to on a high mountain peak and, oh, we hope one day. Not at all. When the Bible says that Abraham is the father of faith, and in the New Testament, Romans uh, 4.16, it says he is the father of us all, what that actually means is the way that he lived is the way that we are to live. And that as the father of us all, that spiritual DNA is to be our spiritual DNA as well. And so what we see in the life of Abraham should be evident and visible in our lives as well. And so we're going to look at that this morning. And we're going to look at one of the hallmarks of Abraham's life. Uh, all of us would say, oh, well, the hallmark is uh, he's, he's faithful. And that's true. But what I want us to do is look at some tangible things in the life of Abraham that show us that are symbolic of some things that should be our, in our lives as well. And so he's the father of faith, the father faithful, but I believe we will see two things in Abraham's life that speak to us as well. Just as Isaac was a digger of wells, we're going to see something about his father, Abraham, this morning, and next week we're going to look at something else in Abraham's life that you may not have thought of, that may not be as apparent uh, to us. Um, so as we get started, uh, let me, let's look at some scriptures. We're going to read a little bit, then we're going to come back to these. And since uh, the best a teacher can do is to show and not tell, uh, let me show and then let's figure it out together. So look at this, and let me just read it for you. See what you start seeing. So uh, at that time, the area was inhabited by Canaanites. But the Lord appeared to Abram. This is before his name has been changed to Abraham. So forgive me, I'm probably going to say Abraham most of the time. Um, but it's the same man, we know. And he appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And then we'll go a little bit further. From there, Abram traveled south and set up camp in the hill country east of Bethel, with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. And there he built another altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So with these two passages, we see the same thing. And if I were to ask you, if we were all seated here together this morning, um, I would say, what do you see? What tangible thing do we see in the life of Abraham, just as we saw in the life of Isaac? What would you say? Okay, sorry, online people, I can't hear you. Um, but the few people who are gathered here, shout it out loudly, please. What do you see? Sorry. We weren't very loud, were we? <laughs> what does Abraham do? Builds. He builds an altar. We saw that in the first passage, and we see it in this passage as well. So he built another altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And we're going to learn some wonderful things about altars this morning. And we're going to see that this marks the life of Abraham. And because it marks the life of Abraham, it is a pattern for us, and it should mark our lives as well. Now, we're not going to go outside and gather some stones and build an altar, but there are spiritual altars, altars in our hearts and lives, just as there, are with, as there were with wells, as we talked about last week. And so, today, we're going to be... Okay, here we go. We're going to be talking about building an altar. Building an altar. And this marks the life of Abraham. He was a builder of altars. But you know, in the Bible, Abraham's uh, altar is not the first altar. There's an altar before Abraham, before Abraham builds this one. And the first altar mentioned in the Bible is by Noah. He leaves the ark. He and his family are saved along with all the animals that God said to gather in the ark, and uh, he comes out of the, the ark, and the very first thing he does is he builds an, alt an altar to God, and he sacrifices on that altar. And so even from Noah's altar building, we see that it is a response to the Lord. It's always a response to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, an altar built 
comes as a response to the Lord in some way. Always, always. Uh, there is, there's, there's never a, a blank space there. It always comes um, in response to what God has done, to what God has said, to what God has shown in Abraham's life and in our lives as well. And so Noah's was first, but if you go all the way back, uh, when Cain and Abel bring their, their offerings to the Lord, the Bible does not say there was an altar, but a lot of Bible scholars believe they probably did build an altar. If you go back even further uh, to the time of the Garden of Eden, you won't see any mention of altars. And why is that? Before sin, there was no separation. Before sin, there was no need for God. I will meet you in this place. Everything was open between God and man. And so there were no altars in Eden. Praise the Lord that through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the altar, which we'll talk about near the end of the message today, the way is open for us to boldly approach God. But there's still a place for altars in our lives today. And so we're going to look at these things. And we're going to look at this man, Abram, this man, Abraham, who will, be, uh, who will become Abraham when God uh, whom God has called. Now, so a lot of us know this passage. And we know his history, but just by way of reminder, God appears to Abram when he's living in a place called Ur. Uh, and Ur is still there today, especially the ruins of the city. And um, God appears to Abram, and Abram uh, marries there. He has two brothers. And one of the brothers die. Uh, one of the brothers brothers has a son named Lot, and then that that uh, then he dies. And so probably later on, when Abram moves and Lot goes with him, it may be because Abraham has sort of adopted Lot in a way because he is an orphan. We don't know how old he was at the time, but Abraham is still living with his father Terah, T E R A H. We're not going to read all those scriptures, um, but in that place in Ur. God appears to Abram. Now, if you look at your Bibles, and if you look in Genesis 12, you won't read, um, you won't read it first when God first appears to Abram. But you know what? If you go all the way to the New Testament, Acts chapter 7, when Stephen begins to preach right before he's martyred, he talks prophetic, uh, not prophetically because it's in the past, but he's inspired to write and to say what happened about Terah and Abram. And we find out there that God appeared to Abram, not just spoke to him. It wasn't just a voice calling. God literally appeared to Abram and said, Abram, leave your family, leave your land, leave your home. So that meant he was also going to leave his inheritance. Because once you left your land and you went to another place, you gave up the inheritance. That's why all the promises of God are so meaningful when we read them about Abram. Because Abram, at one point, finally left all of these things. He left everything he had and owned, everything that was his security, everything that gave him identity. And God said, leave it all and go to a place I will show you. So he gave a command. And he gave promises as well, but the promises were quite vague. I'm going to show you this place. And if you look at the very beginning, God does not at first tell Abraham, I'm going to give you this land. He just says, go to this place I'm going to show you. And so um, we, we think about that and we think, because God is about families, why does God, um, let's go ahead, let me go ahead and turn there. Uh, this is in Genesis 12. It'll be verses 1 through 4. So God tells him, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's house. So I have a question, and I want us to think about it this morning. Why would God say to Abram, leave your father's house? Because God is all about families, brothers and sisters. He really is. He's all about families. Why would he say that? Because if you read further in Joshua, do you know what you will find out? You will find out that Abram's father, Terah, was an idol worshiper. He was an idol worshiper. He lived uh, among a, in a very idolatrous area, and Terah himself 
worshiped, as the Bible says, other gods. And so God wants to do something with Abram. God has a promise for Abram. But as long as Abram is connected to the world and connected to all of these things and finding his security and his support and all of these things, God cannot do something with him. And here's a lesson for us today. We're going to look at this in some of the altars. There are things that God has called, for, called us to do. There are callings that God has for us. And I know he has spoken to people, to those of us in the church, things that he has put in our heart, things that he said to us. But until we separate from some things, God cannot work these things out in our lives. And until we come to the place where we can obey God and follow what God says, God cannot move further in our lives. God cannot do a further work. And so God gives him a command and then God gives him a promise. Brothers and sisters, when God gives you a command, he will always give you a promise. He may not tell you how. He may not tell you when. But with every command, God gives a promise. They always go together. They always go together. And so what does Abraham do? So Abram went. So Abram went. But in this first leaving, Abram only partly obeys. He goes about 600 miles away. Uh, to a place called Haran or Haran, H-A-R-A-N. And guess what? His father goes with him. But now, honestly, before we judge too harshly, how many of you would leave your father behind if your father said, son, I want to go with you? It's a hard thing, isn't it, to make some breaks. It's a hard thing to, to, to sever some of the ties that God says to sever. And um, before some of you get extremely radical and say, ah, my family is not Christian. I must cut with them. This is something special here. And we do what God tells us to do, right? We do what God tells us to do. And so they travel about 600 miles and they end up in Haran. And in Haran, after they live many, many years there, Terah, his father, dies. And at that point, Abram fully follows God and he goes on and he obeys God, and he finally travels about 700 more miles, and he finally arrives in the land of Canaan. Now, we already know this story very well. Most of us know our Bibles quite well. And uh, you can go ahead and think ahead, because we were talking about the Israelites in Egypt. And, and um, as you look at this, think of it this way. Here's Israel, and Ur, uh, Ur of the Chaldees is in modern-day Iraq, by the way. And, uh, and then um, he went up to Haran, and so he's traveling up there. He goes about 600 miles up. Then he travels down about 700 miles to the land that God will give him. So Abram, the father of the Israelite nation, comes in from the north. Hundreds of years later, the Israelites are slaves in Egypt. They're going to come into the land of promise from the south. So that's the, that's, I didn't put up a map, but that kind of gives us the picture. And so Abram in in response to the command of God, finally obeys. But I want us to see something. We looked at this passage just a minute. He arrives in Canaan, and he begins to travel to the, through the land, but it's not what he expects. Look what we read in verse 6. At that time, the area was inhabited by Canaanites. Now, I don't know about you, <clears throat> but if I had left my father, my family, my lands, my inheritance, my home, in response to the command of God, for the great promise of God and arrived in the place to find that the inheritance or the place that God is going to show me is totally inhabited by idolatrous, wicked people, I would be discouraged, wouldn't you? I would be thinking, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I love that God knows us so well because Abram was a man just as you and I are. Abram walked on the ground. His feet hit the ground. He did not float two or three inches above the ground. He went through exactly the same things you and I go through. He felt and feels the same things you and I feel. And I want you to see what happens. He walks through the land. Canaanites are there. Oh, but God is so good. But the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. So here is God in the midst of something that you would think, God, did I miss? God, were you wrong? God, did I misunderstand what you said? I can imagine that there was that question. But Abram instead realizes when God speaks to him, he realizes, no, God, you are right. 
You meant what you said, and I was I I did the right thing when I responded. So what does Abraham do? Here is the first altar that Abram built. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Oh, brothers and sisters, how many of us in times of great difficulty, in times when we're wondering, God, did you really say that word to me? God, did you really give that promise to me? And your faith is wavering and you're doubting, God, was that really your word? And God appears to us and says, yes, I meant what I said. And he reaffirms his promise to us. And the response of Abraham, remember, an altar is always built in response to God. Abraham does what? He built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. An altar is a place where man meets with God. An altar is a place where transactions happen. An altar is a holy place. It is where God, when you respond to the Lord and do something, and you have to do it, God meets with us there, just as he met with Abraham. And Abram, from a believing heart and a grateful heart and a thankful heart, before he receives the fulfillment of the promise, he has still just the words. His feet are on the ground, but the ground isn't his yet. Canaanites are in the land. But Abram, in faithful response, builds an altar to the Lord when he cannot yet see. Brothers and sisters, here's the first altar of Abraham, and it is an altar that you and I must have in our lives if we're going to be children of Abraham, if we're going to be people of faith. Sometimes we will not yet see the answer of God worked out in our lives. Sometimes all we will have is the word of God, the promise of God, but the word of God and the promise of God are sure they are yea and amen, and we can count on it. And in those times, build an altar to the Lord. Build an altar to the Lord. It is a step of faith on our part. Yes, God, I believe your word to me. I believe your promise to me. Just as Abram built an altar, the very first altar he built in the land of Canaan. I want to say one, one thing else about this as well, because here we have this, this first altar in a way is a commemoration of the promise of God to Abram, though the answer has not yet come. But I want us to see something else here as well. God appeared to Abram in Ur, and then he moved to Haran. Did Abram build an altar to God in Ur? No. Did Abram build an altar to God in Haran? No. He builds an altar in Canaan, when he has obeyed the Lord. When in our lives there is not full obedience, there's no place to build an altar. There's no confidence to build an altar. We build an altar when we say yes to God, and we've done what he says to do. Abraham left. Abraham separated. And when he did, when there was obedience, then there was communion with God. There was communion with God, and he built an altar. And the same thing is true in your life and in my life. We must have, don't we desire communion with God? Communion with God that is uninterrupted and unruffled. It comes when we are responding in obedience to the call of God in our lives. And it is at those times that we can build an altar. And so Abraham builds an altar to the Lord. I want, you, I want you to see something else this morning as well about this altar. Does God command an altar of Abraham? No. Do you know that almost all altars in our lives are voluntary altars? You will, you will see that. Later on, you'll see times when uh, God will say, build me an altar here, and it will be in specific response to something. But I want you to see also that most of these altars that Abraham builds, they come from a willing heart. They come from a voluntary, it's something voluntary. And God is so pleased when that comes from our lives, when we build altars. And he always responds. He always responds. But it is our choice to build altars. He will, as we see here, he doesn't say, now, Abraham, I've been really good to you, so please, I want you to build me an altar to show how grateful you are. 
Well, if we're commanded to be grateful, there's no gratefulness in there. In that, is there? Gratefulness comes always from a willing and a voluntary response to the Lord. And this is what we see in Abraham. As he builds an altar in a hostile, impossible situation. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord for this first altar in Canaan. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, Abraham keeps moving, probably because there are Canaanites in the area, and he already has large herds, and he's probably not very welcome where he is. So he keeps on moving, and he keeps kind of moving south. And as we go further along, we read there that Abraham traveled south, and he set up camp in the hill country east of Bethel, with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. There he built another altar to the Lord, and he called on the name of the Lord. So here we see something a little bit different in this second altar. This altar, and, and all of us who read our Old Testaments and at, at all, when we hear the name Bethel, that it rings bells, doesn't it? There's so many things that happen in Bethel. And although it was not called Bethel at that time, at that time it was called Luz or Luz, L-U-Z. It was a different, it was a, a different name. But remember that, so we can't, so don't say, oh, well, yeah, but it wasn't Bethel at that time. I mean, it was called another name. Remember that God is the God of the eternal. He is the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Jesus says, I change not. I change not. And so for as we look at this and from the eyes of the Lord as we see this, so here is Bethel, right by Bethel where Abram uh, builds another altar, and the name Bethel means what? House of God. Bethlehem means house of bread a little bit later, which is a beautiful picture as well, right? But when we have this, Bethel means house of God. And I want us to see something here. Isn't that beautiful? And isn't that instructive for us that Abram keeps on moving and he comes to a place that is house of God, house of God. And he stays there and there he builds an altar to the Lord. Has God done something special at this point? Has God appeared to him? Has God said something and confirmed anything? No, we don't see anything particular or special about this second altar, except that Abram is responding to God. Oh God, you are my God. And Abraham begins a pattern in his life because altars are not just for special occasions. Altars, altars are not just for a commemoration of something special that God does, although they may be that. An altar for the children of faith, as you and I are, they are to be a pattern in our lives. You and I are to have an altar in the house of God where we meet with him, where he dwells, and where we dwell with him. And there is there is a commemoration and there is a fellowship and there's a unity. And Abram builds an altar where the house of God is. And we see a pattern developing. I want to ask you something this morning. And I want to encourage you if this is not yet part of your life. The pattern that we see here is a pattern of altars. And this is what God is calling for every one of us, brothers and sisters. And I can preach this this morning. And this is the word of God. I am as sure, as sure, as sure can be that this is God's message for us this morning. But if it goes no further than a message and we do not build altars in our lives and begin to develop a pattern of building an altar with the Lord, this will do us little good this morning. We must have altars in our lives. And Abraham builds an altar to the Lord. And I want you to see something else here. What does it say? He calls on the name of the Lord. And you heard Marianne preach. Uh, uh, well, she was preaching. Amen. She was praying. But you know what? The God who knows everything and puts all the parts together knew what Moses was going to say knew what Marianne was going to pray, and they didn't know what I was going to preach on this morning. But when Abram calls on the name of God, to call on the name of God has to do with the character of God, the name of God, the character. You heard her say Jehovah Jireh this morning, Jehovah Nisi, all of these names of God that tell us something about who God is in our lives. 
because he is these things in our lives. And I want us to see this morning that as Abram develops this pattern of building altars in his lives, a place of fellowship and, and communion with God, that there is a revelation and an understanding of who God is. We can learn something when we gather together on Sunday morning, but I will tell you something, brothers and sisters, the greatest understanding of God, the greatest revelation of God will not come when we sit and listen to someone else. The greatest revelation of God comes when you and I get alone with God because altars are not with other people. Altars are with you and God alone, alone. And that is when God reveals his precious things to you as he reveals this is who I am to you not just, oh, God in general, but to you. And this is what Abraham is beginning to learn as we see in the second altar, as he calls on the name of God. He calls on the name of the Lord. Depending on your translation, you'll see something else. Instead of called on the name of the Lord, what do some of your translations say? It will say, and he worshiped. That's one of the translations, to call on the name of the Lord. Because when we begin to understand and God reveals himself to us and shows us that he is faithful to every, every generation, that he is the provider, that he's the healer, all of these things, what is our response, brothers and sisters? We worship, don't we? We worship and we respond to the Lord. And so we see this in this second altar that, Ab that Abraham, that Abram builds to the Lord and then we go a little, uh, we go a little bit, bit further. And as we go further, um, you're gonna, you can read it on your own, but then Abraham goes down to Egypt and he blows it. He really messes up. Remember last week when we talked about Isaac? Uh, Isaac is going that way because there's a famine. There's a famine and Abraham goes down to Egypt. But remember with Isaac, God told Isaac, don't go down to Egypt. Because Egypt is always in the Bible. We didn't talk about this last week. Maybe sometime in the future we'll talk about it more. Uh, Egypt was a, was, an, is, was a symbol of uh, a dependence on the, the wealth of the world, the strength of the world, uh, the, the, the uh, provisions of the world. And so Abraham goes down there, but he really makes a mess there. Does Abraham build an altar in Egypt? No. We don't build altars when we're depending on the world and the world's provisions. An altar, one of the things that an altar means is, oh God, I depend on you. Because an altar is the lesser to the greater. And in building that altar, we are saying, oh God, you're the one who's great in my life. You're the one I depend on in my life. Abram builds no altar in Egypt because he's depending on the goods of Egypt and the wealth of Egypt. And then, he, but praise the Lord, um, because Abraham is like us, he finally leaves Egypt. And when he leaves Egypt, very, very instructive for us. Look at what it says. It says that from the Negev, which is in the south, he went from place to place, because he had a lot of herds, until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier, and where he had first built an altar. And there... Abram called on the name of the Lord. I believe this morning that some of us need to return to some altars in our lives. We've left them, and we've depended on things other than God, wisdom other than God, the help of other people, our own resources. And it's time for us to return to the altar of God, the house of God at Bethel, and say, oh God, and to call on his name again. And that's what Abram does there. Right after this, and, and so this is not an altar. He probably had to repair the altar because he was in Egypt for a while. So there are, um, Abram builds four altars. This is a, another reference to an altar, uh, to, to an altar that he has built earlier. But right after this, something really big happens in Abram's life. And this is when <clears throat> Lot and Abraham separate. Uh, they both have extensive herds. By the way, Lot follows him down to Egypt as well. And they both increase. They both gain a lot of, of wealth. And then Abram, as a wonderful, faithful person, uh, lets Lot choose first. And Lot looks with his eyes, 
and he chooses with his eyes, his worldly eyes. Look what happens next. After Lot had separated, the Lord said to Abram, Look as far as you can see every direction, north and south, east and west. I am giving all this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants as a permanent possession. And I will give you so many descendants that like the dust of the earth, they cannot be counted. Get up and walk from one end of the land to the other, for I will give it to you. I want you to see something here. We're not looking at Lot this morning, but Lot looked with worldly eyes and worldly desire. Abraham looked with eyes of faith. Brothers and sisters, let us learn to look with eyes of faith. Because when we look with eyes of faith, we will see what God has for us. And we will know, God, this is my inheritance. This is my inheritance. And God will give you much more than you could ever get for yourself. That's the kind of God he is. And so Abram does that. So Abram moved his camp to Hebron, and he settled near the oak grove belonging to Mamre, and there he built another altar to the Lord, a wonderful altar. So the altar at Hebron. What is this altar? Oh, this one's a beautiful. This is a wonderful altar. The word Hebron comes from the root to join, and it means literally the place of joining or alliance. And it signifies friendship and fellowship. So it comes from the root to join. It literally means the place of joining. But it signifies and symbolizes friendship or fellowship. And this is where Abram builds an altar. Hebron is the place that Abraham lives longer than any other place in his life. Hebron is the place where Abraham meets with God in person and prepares a meal for him. Hebron is the place where God says, hmm, shall I not tell Abraham what I'm going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah? And this is the place, Hebron is the place where the God of the universe speaks to a man who has chosen to fellowship with him, and he tells him his plans. Brothers and sisters, in the place of fellowship, at the altar of fellowship, you will be friends with God. You will have fellowship with God. God will reveal his plans to you. He will speak to you as a friend, and you and God will be together in friendship and fellowship at the altar of Hebron. Don't you want that in your life? Oh, I long for that in my life, that I'm a friend of God, as Abraham was called, a friend of God, a place where God and I, it's not on occasion when something special happens. It's not on occasion when there's a big issue, but it is a place a fellowship, a daily communion with the Lord. And that's where Abram builds, <clears throat> builds an altar. And that's where Abram spends most of his life. That's where Abram has the only land he ever personally owns in Canaan. His descendants will one day inherit, but all Abram has in that place is a field and a cave where he later buries his beloved wife, Sarah. Oh, this is the place we want. This is the altar that we want in our lives because it's an altar of fellowship. This is what I just read to you. Should I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? He's going to become great in a powerful nation. All the nations of the earth, earth will be blessed through him. And now I want us to see one other thing. And, and because of our time this morning and we started later, we're going to go a little bit later this morning because we've got one more, one more altar after this that we want to talk about. But I want you to see something here this morning and want to speak first to those of you who are parents, okay? But those of you who say, I'm not a parent, do, am I included? Yes, you are included. And I want to talk about sphere of influence in relation to altars just a minute. So for parents... Your greatest sphere of influence, 
your most important sphere of influence is your family. There's no greater sphere of influence. It doesn't matter if you're a captain and a titan of industry. Your greatest responsibility, your greatest sphere of influence is your family. If you do not have a family, as I, uh, 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 people who are younger, I have mothers and fathers or whatever, but uh, all of us, um, our greatest sphere of influence will be those that are around us. Some of you, if you're single and you don't have children, you still have a sphere of influence. Everyone has a sphere of influence. It may be friends. It may be colleagues. It may be schoolmates. So those of you who are young people here this morning, you say, well, I'm just a teenager or I'm just this or that. You have a sphere of influence. And I'm speaking to you this morning as well. I... I I don't care if you're 12 or 13 years old. You should be building altars in your life as well. Don't wait till you get a lot older. Build them now. Build them now. You have a sphere of influence as well. And I want us to see this picture that because Abram has built an altar in his life, the overflow of this is an influence in his family. There is a godly influence. Parents, there should be because you have built uh, uh, spiritual altars in your lives. There must be, there must be an overflow of godliness in your family's life. Uh, women, if you are married to a, a non-Christian husband, husband, he is your sphere of influence and the altar of your life, a fellowship with the Lord, can flow over into his life as well. And we see this as God speaks about Abram, for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abram what he has promised for him. And this faithfulness of Abram in his life to build an altar this morning as you and I sit here, the faithfulness of Abraham, we this morning are receiving the blessings of. This morning, because of Abram's faithfulness. So I encourage you this morning, whatever your age, whether you are married or not, you have a sphere of influence. And the altar of Hebron in your life, a friendship and a fellowship, can and should flow over to touch others and to reach others. And then there's one more altar, and we get, this will be our last altar this morning. And this is the altar that if you know the life of Abram, Abraham, you already know about. Because by this time, uh, oh, by that time, he was already called Abraham. So I, we can call him Abraham now. And the very last altar that Abraham builds in his life has to do with the most difficult test that he ever encounters. It has to do with something that God asks of him. And this is the one time that God says, Abram, give me this. And we know what this is, don't we? This is in Genesis 22. God tests Abraham, and he says, Abraham, give me your son, your only son, the son that you love. Go to a place that I will show you, and there offer him up to me. And Abram, Abraham gets up the very next morning. There's no hesitation. Think about this, because Abraham has walked with God now. Abraham has fellowshiped with God. Abraham knows the character of God. And unlike the old Abram that waits 60 or 70 years to fully obey God and make it to Canaan, this Abraham has walked with God, knows God's character because he's had an altar with God in his life. And the very next morning, he gets up in obedience and he walks and he goes to the mountain that God is going to show him to build an altar and to give his son. And as they go along, Isaac says, Father, where is the sacrifice? Where's the sacrifice? You can read this for yourself in Genesis 22. And Isaac spoke up. This is in verse 7. And he said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And if you read the exact translation, do you know what the exact translation is? God will provide for himself. That's the exact translation. Because we know that this sacrifice and this altar points to a far greater sacrifice and a far greater altar, doesn't it? 
and they go up to the mountain. And I want you to see something here, beloved, this morning. We receive promises from the Lord, and we hold on to these things. But I want to say to you that there is something greater than holding on to a promise in your life. There's something greater than trusting a promise in your life. And that is trusting the one who has promised. Abraham has learned who God is at this point. And he doesn't just hold on to the promise that God has given him. Abraham trusts God. And that's the highest trust you and I can have beyond the promise that he gives you. And there are wonderful promises. The reason you and I can trust God's word to us and God's promise to us is because of the one who has given us his word and who has made the promise. Don't just hold on to the words of the promise. Hold on to God. Hold on to God. And he is faithful. He's faithful. And that will give you a bedrock in your life. Those of us that are saying, one day soon, Jesus is coming back. He says in his word, and I'm looking forward to that day. Yes, that is true. But what we hold on to is the God who says, I'm coming back for you. That's who we hold on to. And Abraham says, God himself will provide the lamb. He's holding on. He knows the character of the one who has promised. And so when they reached, here we come, here's the last altar. When they reached the place, it was in the, the region of Moriah. It was a mountain range that God had told them about. Abraham built an altar there. And this altar is the altar of sacrifice. And brothers and sisters, we can only go so far with God until we must build an altar of sacrifice in our lives. And if we are unwilling to build an altar of sacrifice, we'll still make it to heaven. God will still love us. But we will never have the full blessings and the full promise of God that come from a free will sacrifice that God will then honor. And he bound his son. He built an altar. He arranged wood. He bound his son Isaac, and he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand, and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven. And the angel of the Lord is the Lord, right? The angel of the Lord is the Lord. Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. You see, Abraham knew the voice of God because he'd had an altar with God, and he knew what God's voice sounded like. And the, and the angel of the Lord, the Lord himself says, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. We know what comes next, don't we? Abraham looks up, and he sees a ram. He sees a, a, a sheep that's caught, and he takes that, and that's the lamb, that's the, the sheep, that's the sacrifice that God provides at that moment. But we know that what God was really talking about is this. And so Abram, Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Because you see, brothers and sisters, as most of us know, this mountain, the region of Mount Moriah, is the place where David later builds an altar to the Lord. He takes it from Arana, the threshing, the threshing floor of Arana. He buys it, and he builds an altar. And Arana says, oh, King David, here, here, take this. Take my oxen, take this. You can, you can give this altar to the Lord. And you know what David says? See, this, this, this is why we know it's an altar of sacrifice. We see how Abraham responds. And in the same spot, I, I, did I record it? Yes, I recorded it. Let me go ahead and put it. Let me go a little bit further. This is the further part. Look at this part in Samuel 24, 24, and 25. When Arana wants to give it to him so that he can offer it on the altar to God, what does David say? David says, 
No, I insist on buying it from you for a price, for I will not offer to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. He bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 ounces of silver, and then he built an altar there to the Lord. And this was, go ahead and read the whole passage, this is where Abraham built an offer and built an altar and offered Isaac to the Lord, an altar of sacrifice. This is where David builds an altar and it costs him something. I will not give to the, to the Lord what costs me nothing. And brothers and sisters, there must be, if we're going to go with God, if you want the best of God, if you want good enough, you can have good enough. I don't want good enough. I want the best. But the best of God requires a sacrifice. And there's a place of the altar, but there's a price of the altar as well. And this area, Moriah, is the scene of the altar that Abraham builds. It's the scene of the altar that David builds. It is the building place of the temple that Solomon builds where there are altars. And hundreds of years into the future, it is this area where there's another altar and another only son, another precious son was offered and was sacrificed. This is where Jesus was sacrificed on the altar in the region of Moriah, in the same area. That's where God offered his son, his only son. God said to Abraham, I see now that you fear me, you, you honor me. And what you and I can say when we see that God offered Jesus on the altar, I see now that you love me. There's no question. There's no question. And when God says to Abraham, through you, because you gave Isaac, all the nations of the world will be blessed. All the people of the world will be blessed. It was because one day, the root of David, the son of Jesse, Jesus would come, and he too would be sacrificed on an altar. And because of that, we are blessed. But there must be an altar of sacrifice. I, I, I believe that Abraham understood something of that on the mountain that day. Because you know what it says later? When Jesus is talking to the Jews later, Jesus says to them, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Abraham, 2,000 years earlier, almost, because Abraham lived about 2,000 years, 2,000 B.C. or so. You say, well, can, you, can, you quote, can you say that for sure? This is what I believe. Abraham saw it in faith when he offered. And there must be altars of sacrifice in our lives. And so as we come to a close this morning and as the worship team comes this morning, and we're just going to respond to the Lord in any way, I want to encourage you this morning, don't be afraid to build an altar of sacrifice and to sacrifice to the Lord because what we receive from the altar of sacrifice is so much greater, is so much more wonderful than anything that we put on that altar. We receive from the Lord. And so as we come to a close this morning, I'm going to pray as they are just getting ready this morning. You can come up and begin playing. And I'm going to ask you if you're here this morning, um, just to, if you need to keep your eyes closed so you're not disturbed by anything. Um, if you've been seated for a while and you'd like to stand, I invite you to stand. And we're just going to respond to the Lord. We, we can build a, a, an altar right here this morning. If you're watching us, you're with us at home this morning, I want to invite you also to turn your attention away from anything else. If you're here, to, if you're watching as a family, you may want to stand as well. And we just want to respond to the Lord this morning. And I ask, um, you've heard a lot this morning, and you've heard about these four altars. And I ask you to listen again to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you this morning. Are there the altars that 
altar when you first come into Canaan, even in a, a difficult situation. It's based on full obedience, and you need to build that altar so that there can be communion. Or the altar at Bethel, the house of God, the house of God, where a pattern is developed in your life. The altar of Hebron. Oh, this is what I long for. This is what I long for. The altar of fellowship and friendship with God, in and out, in fellowship and communion with God, eating a meal with him, hearing him speak to me, having him reveal what he's going to do so that I know his plans. But I don't want to remain there and not go higher. No surprise that he had to climb the mountain to build an altar of sacrifice. And if we would go higher with the Lord, we must go up for the altar of sacrifice. Holy Spirit, we come to you this morning. Speak to our hearts. God, do not let us, do not let us, just listen this morning. Lord, let us begin to build altars in our lives. Or Lord, return to some altars that we left behind and started depending on other things. We come to you today. God, in your people, in Lighthouse, build altars. May we build altars. May we choose. May we make a, a choice. May we make a decision. May we do something about it and not just listen to one Sunday morning message. In Jesus' name.